And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a couple returning good brothers back into the temple. Back for another round, they are the double-headed monster behind Mystic Days. In the red corner, we have Dave Yeager, and in the blue corner, we have Andy Thomas. Um, no Chuck Yeager jokes, please. We've heard them all. <laughs> yeah. If you get, if Dave, if you haven't had Chuck Yeager jokes at your expense, I'd be disappointed. Oh no, I've had them. I've had them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the oh. problem. Hello, Melder. Good to good to be back. <laughs> yeah, it is good to be back. Good to, ha good to have you guys back. Congratulations on a successful relaunch. So I guess I'll start with I guess I'll start with that since I had you on a while back. You guys were you guys were were attempting to kickstart Mystic Days. Um, things didn't go as to plan. What would you say were the big were some of the big takeaways that you learned from that first experience and tried to and tried to apply with this second attempt? Oh boy, um, you want to take that, Dave? Well, <laughs> that's a big question. Yeah, w one of the big things is you know we're we're kind of old school people, and so we immediately think box set. Um, so so there you've got to buy boxes, you've got to buy all the books up front, all the dice. I mean, we were having to buy a minimum of five hundred boxes, uh, two hundred and fifty of each book. So that's seven hundred and fifty books between the three books. Mm -hmm. and then the dice so so we were looking at needing you know over 10 grand to even print the first book and that was kind of a uh probably a big big lurch for for two no-name people in a no-name game you know an unknown mm -hmm. uh, if we would have been doing a 5e uh companion or something where it was a little more known game it might have gone a little better uh Maybe not. I don't know, but I think that's a lot of it. And uh, then, of course, our, our marketing genius that we don't have <laughs> didn't play into that very well either. Mm -hmm. But but we learned, and uh, that's this time around we we uh, decided we'd go with drive through RPG. Mm -hmm. um, that stopped us from having to have a minimum amount before we could even get going. So that helped a lot. Uh, that, that's really probably the key reason that we're funded this time, is we didn't have to go out and buy 750 books before we could send anybody one, you know? So I think that was the biggest thing. We just had to stand back, look at what we were doing, and look what other people did, and wake ourselves up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, me, personally, I love a box set. I still would really love to put out a box set. I, I, I like having everything in the box. You know, I don't know. That's that's just the old me, I guess. But uh, so that, that's still a goal as far as I'm concerned. But uh, doing it this way, we can get the game out into people's hands without having to meet that large amount of money up front. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we decided this way would be the best route. And I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Andy, but. Or did he disappear on us? I think he disappeared, didn't he? No, he disconnected and reconnected, and I just oh, didn't okay. see Oh, okay, here it. he comes. Excellent. <laughs> oh. So that, that, that was the big thing, though, I think, more than anything. It's just uh, we, we had to get such a large amount up front, and uh, we haven't it, – it's not like we're world-renowned. It's not even like we're state-renowned. Um, or, you know, or a couple guys with a new game out that not mm -hmm. a lot of people heard about. So, doing it this way, we made it, you know, hit a few more conventions. Uh, the conventions we've been to, everybody seems to have a good time playing it. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they like the concepts. So, so we're excited, uh, you know, we finally got it where we can get it in people's hands now. Mm -hmm. And I do remember... I do remember having a having a conversation not too far removed from that from that whole box set issue with um, the guy behind Giant Lance. Okay. While yeah. he while he while he was steadfast in not in not doing and not doing digital, um, 
I can certainly understand why why, the, why there's hesitation, but I've I've and for the longest time I was right I was right in that same camp of not of not wanting to do any sort of di any sort of digital stuff. Right. But I honestly think that the the pandemic and all the lockdowns for uh, made people reassess how they handle that kind of thing, and that's and you ended up seeing a this explosion when it came to virtual tabletop. And to be fair, there are th there are things that can be done in that in that kind of system that can't be done in in a regular approach, and vice versa. Right. Yeah, and, and we were kind of, and we're still kind of on the fence. I, I think we're going to offer. We're not offering PDF only at this point. Mm -hmm. um, we did offer. We went ahead and offered it for the people that bought the books. We'd send them a PDF with it. Mm -hmm. um, we're not real techie, so all we can think of is a PDFs out there. And I know, like D and D, within a week of their books going out, somebody's already copied it, put online. And uh, I guess they could do that to anything. So we were just kind of gun shy doing the PDF only, though. Uh, we're going to offer it. We haven't offered it with this Kickstarter. Um, but, you know, if you, if you buy the set, you'll get a PDF with it also of everything. I know a lot of people like to do it on their tablets now, and I understand that. Mm -hmm. um, we just we don't know the security protocols or anything else, and people can get past those anyway. So is it even worth going that? far i don't know <laughs> we're still we're still kicking that around you know mm -hmm. now when it come now when it comes to i think i mentioned i think i mentioned this beforehand but for whatever reason when i when i was going through when i was going through mystic days mm -hmm. i don't know and i i don't know why i ended up thinking of this but i ended up thinking of talislanta talislanta that one I'm not familiar with. Um, tell us when it comes to when it comes to tabletop. It's bit it's its tagline for ye for years was no elves. No I. Elf. I they because they wanted to do a fa they wanted to do a fantasy a fantasy game, but not rely on the on the typical trappings of what people expect from a fantasy game. I right. eat what I've come to call the Tolkien melting pot. Yeah. And oh, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with Tolkien's work. It's just that I don't I don't like the idea that 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 if I'm doing fantasy, that's the template I have to use. Right. Uh, right. But and given that you guys, given that you guys are going with a far more freeform approach, especially with the emphasis on skills. Yeah. Um. Could you tell me about the moment where you re where you realized that skills weren't going to work, or did you, or was a skill, or was a um, not skills, that classes weren't going to work, or in an early draft did you try and balance it with a class system? No, we really tried to get rid of the classes right up front on that. Uh, that that was one of our issues, uh, and I, I hate to keep going back to D and D, but most people are familiar with that. But, we'll be know, going to D and D a lot because because art is a response to other art, right? Right, and uh, uh, but once you picked your class, you were stuck in that class, uh, and you're a shoebox. There's there's nothing more you could do, and we always hated that. You know why why can't a magic user wear armor? Why can't a thief wear armor? Uh, there was just a lot of stuff in there that we didn't like, so we we wanted to come up with a way that you know it, do what you want. You're only going to get good at what you use uh that was another thing we didn't like you know if you went up in class everything in your class you got better at mm -hmm. which sometimes you didn't use any of your stuff in, in your classes uh sometimes you use very little and uh, so that was another reason to go to a skills based and uh you, you know you get better as you use it not just because you jump up in a level and that's kind of why we did away with levels too in in the I, I guess we're not completely done. We don't call them levels. We call them degrees in how you can get better in your special skills. But you only get better as you use them. <clears throat> so it's not that you level up and, and you're, you're, you're plus one across the board or whatever that level up means and whatever 
yeah. RPG, you know, you're you're working in. Yeah, the whole the whole thing of leveling as you use it is very reminiscent of st of stuff like um, most of the games in the ba in the basic role playing fa um, family. So your Rune Quest, your Call of Cthulhu, your both Elric and Stormbringer. Why you need why you need to have two games based on the same source material with the same system is beyond me. But <laughs> that's how it was. Um, yeah. But 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 all of, all of them kind of have all of them kind of have that approach of of um get of getting XP based based on skill use, right? Um, and we've also seen that in cer in certain video games like like say the like say my whipping boy for so many years the Elder Scrolls series. But when it comes to because of that design. I could mm -hmm. see the possibility of there of of a temp, of a temptation of um of on, of the of the of the play skewing towards towards um what's towards what skills they want to improve what skills they want to improve has that kind of thing happened where where some where somebody somebody tries to go out go out of their way to justify a certain skill use oh well <laughs> In, in a way, we, we kind of want to, we want people to do that. We, we want people to think outside of the box, you know. <laughs> um, that's how you but, get, that's how you get somebody trying to backstab a book because it has a spine. Yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's only limited to what you can think of. And that's kind of how we wanted it to be. Um of, of course, there's people that are going to play to their skills, and they should. Uh, I mean, in, in real life, you're going to do that. If, if you're in a battle, you're, you're not going to try something odd. You're going to try something you know works, mm -hmm. and you're going to keep using it as long as it works. Um, so I, I guess I haven't seen it to a point where it's concerned me at all, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. did, did Andy make it back on, or is he He's still... back. Okay. Hey, I'm, I, I, I don't I know what he I'm thinks back. on that, but... As my chiropractor uh, often says, glad to see you're back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I, well, I think uh, one thing we haven't played it enough with enough people to find out just what number of crazy different ideas people can come up with. But as far as the, the special skills um, that we've got, we we only have thirty of them that we really thought were at least pertinent to include at this point but um, I guess you could you could probably find some way to be really goofy with with those I would think people could really find intriguing ways to to twist the um, the rules for magic around um, more mm -hmm. than anything mm -hmm. and Although we, although even with that, you the what you've what you end up touching upon some something that I've been critical of of certain games, but especially but especially D, especially D and D because of some of the boasts that it that its adherents have made for most of my life, mm -hmm. and that is this idea that you can use it to run any kind of fantasy, and you look at the way the game is designed, and there's a there there's a bit of a problem that you can summarize with the phrase "shit" or "get off the pot," as far as what style okay. of fantasy it wants to be. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at if I were if I look at say RuneQuest, I know what kind of fantasy that's trying to be. Um, very very sword and sorcery inspired, very very um gr very fertile crescent, almost um, Greco Roman influences th throughout it um if i if i look if i look at let's see if i look at say mo say um the mongoose conan era well i know what's uh, it's doing it's going to be conan so i'm dealing with sword and sorcery um right. i mentioned and if i'm if i'm running seventh c I expect a whole lot of swashbuckling, and I expect to bonk people over the head when they do bet when they do a bad pirate accent. 
the point yeah. is is that there's is that there's multiple avenues when it comes to fantasy and trying to say you can do right. all of them at once and you you either have to build for that assumption or you've got to pick one can't do both no I I, I agree and, and I, I would classify it as um, high fantasy mm -hmm. um, with the you, you know you could say medieval high fantasy but um, I would caution those who are uh, seeking a genuine medieval type rule experience. You're not a simulationist um, approach. Based in... Right. It's not a medieval simulation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. But that's that's the like the mm -hmm. the era as far as technologically advanced goes. Mm -hmm. Minus the magic, of course. Yeah. <laughs> now. Yeah. You, I, you mm -hmm. couldn't. I don't mm -hmm. believe you can play Star Frontiers with Mystic Days rule system. Well, you, you know, you'd have you to. You might be able to. to uh, um, that's a that depends. In, in, uh, somehow. That depends. How much beer are you willing to bribe me with? Right. <laughs> because, yeah. and yet, and because um, if you give if you give me enough time, liquor, and and mom and moments of ingenuity, I could pr I could probably make it work. Then again, I am somebody who unironically argued argued that a barbarian should be able to wear beer armor. Right. Right. Well, and, and, you know, it's just like I said, you can homebrew anything. Mm -hmm. But as far as the rule set as it is, it, it would be high fantasy. Um, yeah. So that's just what it's set up for. We have nothing for weapons, like guns, mm -hmm. uh, anything like that. So uh, to go any different would you'd have to homebrew the rules and and that's fine too uh you know we that that's where this come from uh you know it started in D D. this is homebrew and uh, it worked into this and if it wasn't for that we wouldn't have half the games we have mm -hmm. so you know we encourage it we, you know if you can tweak something and make something work let us know how, how you how you did it and see if people like it we're all for it uh I do remember one time when my players got a bit got a bit miffed with me because they thought they were going to be doing a they thought they were going to be doing a reg, a regular fantasy campaign and then I slit and then I slid in elements of expedition to the barrier peaks <laughs> without telling okay. them. So things they weren't quite expecting. Yeah, then all all of a, all of a sudden. All, it's a normal fantasy campaign. Then all of a sudden, um, all of a sudden, energy weapons are being pulled out, and somebody has a noisy yeah. cricket. Um, yeah. <laughs> although I, I told, I told them that it's analogous to the noisy cricket. They, they, um, they thought, okay, good, okay, good. I've got a powerful sonic weapon. What they, what they forgot, to, what they forgot is the fact that if you've seen Men in Black, you know the noisy cricket works both ways. <laughs> Or to put it another way, a lot of recoil. Right. <laughs> yeah. Because I like giving players, I like giving players very, um, powerful weapons that are very, that are just as dangerous for the user as they are for the target. Well, but that's what makes it fun then. Mm -hmm. and, and if you get through it alive, that makes it you know all the more her heroic. You know. Yeah. Uh, that was a, uh, and I, I can't remember. If we had played this before we did the first interview with you or not, but that that was one of the the things everybody remembers is uh, the magic user was trying to cast a lightning bolt and he failed. Mm -hmm. And out of eight people, it just so happened to roll that he hit the person he was trying to and uh, electrocuted him and blew him off the cliff. Yeah. And then, not too much farther in the game, he tried to cast lightning bolt again and end up killing himself. So. You know, that's that's the things you remember. Mm -hmm. That's that's what makes them fun. You know, the unknown. Yeah, and I've, I have, jo there's a there's a certain phrase that I've that some people I know and who've been in the military have have used that I've kind of adopted. And that is, if it's stupid but it works, it's not stupid. That that's right. Yeah, if it accomplished what you wanted it to do. It doesn't care if somebody calls it stupid. <laughs> you you got done what you needed to do. So yeah, no, no. Andy says he probably isn't going to get back on. It just isn't working for him tonight. He lives out 
quite a bit out in the country. So yeah i i had prepared I had prepared for the possibility that um, technology was going to screw us over in one form. Yeah. So yeah, it it is a bit of a burden being right all the time. <laughs> He's going to try, but yeah, he, he's relying strictly on cell towers. Mm -hmm. I know, I, cer I certainly know that feeling. Yeah. But since we, since we mentioned last time I had, last time I had you guys on, I didn't have all that much of a time to, de to dedicate to magic. Um, okay. Yep. And what I, what I what I the first thing that I find kind of interesting is instead of using a spell a spell level like a a spell level like approach or or the like, you simply ha you simply have a spell you have a spell point system, but you're not you're not list you're not listing off spells based on based on rank. Correct, correct. Um, how we did it is is beginning spellcasters have to learn their first three spells either through a scroll or from another spellcaster. Mm -hmm. And they have to learn from another spellcaster the art of harnessing, which is drawing the energy from around you, and then the art of channeling it into a spell. Mm -hmm. And once they've done that and raised their... Uh, in magic, we use uh, a channel dice or a casting dice. And depending on how often you use the spell, uh, there, this again is another you only improve as you use it you've got to increase your dice by one mm -hmm. or by two excuse me you're casting dice by two once you've done that then you can try any spell you want um i don't know how much you read into the spells uh, uh magic and mystic days can be very dangerous um if you're unsuccessful there is a cost there, there's always uh there's there's one roll out of seven, I guess, that nothing happens mm -hmm. if you miscast your spell. Uh, any other roll, and there there is some sort of cost for it, and mm -hmm. that's where we limit. Uh, you know, if you're a beginning spellcaster, you're 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 rolling a d6. The the spell dice you roll against is always a d12. Um, so if you're on a D4 or D5 or D6 against that D12, are you going to want to harness a really large spell because a miscast on a really spell or really large spell could be a party killer? Mm -hmm. So so that's kind of where we limited spell use is how awful failures can be. Um, we're we're kind of hoping people are kind of <laughs> yeah. I shouldn't say it because there's always somebody that just doesn't care and they just want to kill as much as they can. Um, but we're hoping that kind of reins them in a little bit on, on spell use because it can be a really big danger to your party. So mm -hmm. you only want to use it when you need it. You don't just flippantly uh, use a spell to light a candle. Um, it's, it's something you want to you want to be sure you want to use before you do that. And, and as mm -hmm. you get better, of course, your chances will get better. But you still always got that low roll. Uh, even the best spellcaster can have a failure. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we always wanted we, we we always wanted it to where there's no chance of somebody becoming invincible in this game. Yeah, that was one of the things that got us in D and D. Once you got up into the higher levels, I mean, you could sit there and laugh at a dragon. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, there wasn't much you could do to you. And we wanted to to make sure that anybody could die at any time. So use your wits. <laughs> But now, given the given the given the fact that you have two die types, the harness and the ch and the channel die. Yep. Um. When when you're running the when you're running the game and somebody wants to be able to do some casting, how do you pitch the difference between the harness and channel die to to them? Well, the the harness die is just what you got to roll to 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 harness the energy from around you. Mm -hmm. And you get a plus if you do it outside of combat. If you do it in a, in a calm situation, it's a plus four on your harness die. Mm -hmm. And that dice is going to go up very quickly because you're going to improve on that dice because harnessing energy, it doesn't matter what spell you're, you're harnessing it for, your harness die just goes up because you're just drawing raw energy. Mm -hmm. so, so that dice will increase 
really quickly to where you get to where it's not much of a problem for you to harness. Mm -hmm. um, and then the casting die is what, uh, depending on your your wisdom, is what casting die you start with and the maximum casting die you can have. Um, so you might start with a D4 or a D6 or a D8, and then you've got to cast that spell enough to where you get, uh, I don't know if you looked at all uh, how the progression goes as you cast spells. Mm -hmm. um, you will get, and off the top of my head, I think I'm wrong. I think it's five points on a successful cast and one point on an unsuccessful. You know, we believe you fall forward. That uh, mm -hmm. uh, a failure also gives you an idea of what you did wrong. So uh, let me find it here. Well, that's mm -hmm. probably so, so anyway, you, like I say, your harness dice will increase really fast, mm -hmm. and then your spell dice, each each spell you have is going to start out at the bottom dice, mm -hmm. and as you cast it, you'll get better with that particular spell. You won't cast lightning and get better with fire. Mm -hmm. So... Um, and with the now, with that with that in mind, um, one thing one thing that I did notice is that you have a set of um, a set a set of failure effects for e for each uh, for each spell for each, each major spell. spell. Correct. There, there's there's uh, spell specific failures, mm -hmm. and then there's also a table on just a raw energy release that uh, uh, it. If you decide you, you have a, you know, you're running a spellcaster and you decide you want him to harness a thousand energy points because you know that you're going into a possible battle or uh, mm -hmm. into a cave system, you don't know what's up. So he's got all this energy harnessed. If, if something hits him, uh, an arrow, a uh, goblin comes up, strikes him, whatever, if he takes damage, there's a chance he could lose control of that harness energy. Mm -hmm. So there's a raw energy table to make up for that. If, if he just has raw energy and and that's one of the things a one on the specific spell failures that's that's always that nothing happens that's the only mm -hmm. time that nothing will happen uh on a failed spell and a seven will make you go to the raw energy release and roll on that table mm -hmm. so there's really only five different effects you're going to get on a on the specific spell failure tables and then there's up to 48 on the, well, 46. It's 2 to 48 on the raw energy release. Mm -hmm. So the raw energy release can be anything. The specific spell failure tables, it will have something around that spell that goes wrong, the specific spell that you're using. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a heal spell, you might accidentally, uh, you might miscast it and cast all of your life points into the person you're trying to heal. Mm -hmm. And uh, kill yourself in the process, um, depending how many how many life points you were trying to trying to heal. So, mm -hmm. so that's the way the uh, the spell failure tables work. Yeah. Now, when it comes to now the other the other thing I was the other thing I was curious about is what. In some ca in in some cases, learn um, casting spells from scrolls or or spell book is seen as safer, even even though you even though you have a limited amount of times you can do it. Um, what would be the difference between someone casting just just straight out just straight out versus casting using a scroll or a spell book? If you find a scroll, you automatically raise one casting die for that spell. Mm -hmm. If it's a learned spell or off a scroll, you will, you will gain one casting die. So if you if you normally start at a five, you would start with a six on that particular spell, and then you go up from there. Mm -hmm. So that's where a scroll helps you out, or if you learn from you know if you have a mentor wizard and your apprentice, uh, whatever spells he teaches you will automatically up you one casting die from your minimum. Mm -hmm. But then after that, they don't do you any good. That, that's that's as much as they help you. Yeah. And I, I remember right in D and D, the the scrolls would disappear, mm -hmm. or 
or this you lose them from your memory um yeah we, we didn't do that um after you get that initial lift in your casting die i mean we've got i think it's what is it 48 spells no more than that uh 58 spells and then we've got the formula in the book that you can try anything your uh your referee allows you to try in his game mm -hmm. anything you can think of we've got the the formula in place on what you want to do whether it's area of effect or how many life points of damage you want it to do how far away it is mm -hmm. so we, we really kind of encourage we want people to we we didn't want there to be a limit on magic um you know if, if you can pull that energy in why can't you try whatever you want with it yeah um, of course, something odd, you're already starting at your very basic dice. Mm -hmm. and so there's a lot better chance of failure. <laughs> but we, we wanted that to be open-ended. And uh, we, we really want to get a page up, uh, uh, like for oh discussion, but also for homebrew rules or spells or whatever. People mm -hmm. come up with something like, throw it on there. Uh, share it, you know. And I... Uh, mm -hmm. Go ahead. I can I can certainly get that. Um, now, when it come when it comes to since you get since when it comes to advancement, since you're not doing since you're not doing levels, I'd like I'd like to go into how you how you ma how you manage the whole lear the whole learn by doing approach that that you're utilizing. Okay. Uh Learn by doing, okay, for spells, and I was wrong, for mm -hmm. spells, you, you get to, for advancing your first dice, you get 10 points each time you cast your spell successfully. Mm -hmm. You get, back to the table here, you will get three points on every fail. Mm -hmm. Once you get to 100 points, you go to the next die higher. Then on your second dice, it's five for every success and two on every fail until you mm -hmm. get 100 points. Then you go to the next die, and then it, it keeps dropping down. Then it's four for every success and one for every fail. So mm -hmm. it gets a little harder. It takes longer to increase. Mm -hmm. And, and you got to remember, this is for every spell. This isn't, you know, for all spells gain that at the same time. That's for each spell you use. You've got to use it that much to increase to the next dice for that spell. Mm -hmm. And then in combat, we did it the same way. Um, your dexterity is, of course, what uh, what dictates what what starting die you have, mm -hmm. and then uh, that part in here. I th I think your combat is what started out at five. If I mm -hmm. let me find the table here. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, your combat starts out at five and one on a fail, mm -hmm. and then it goes to four and four and one, two and one, and mm -hmm. then just one and zero on a fail after that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's how your progression works as on, on your skills and everything else as you use them. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you gain a little quicker at first, but it's, it's slower as you gain. Yeah, and I'm I'm guessing that I'm guessing that because of that, there's a bit of encouragement to. To have to have a ver to have a variety instead instead of instead of dumping everything into a few things. Well, yeah, and that's where you know if if you want to be say a fighter thief, uh, you know you're, you're gonna spend your time in the battlefield and, and picking locks and, and that type of thing, uh, moving silently. So, what do you want your character to do? Uh, you don't want to, you know, just like in real life, you can't be great at everything. You, mm -hmm. you pick a few things and get really good at it, and the other things, you, you know, you're kind of the, the handyman type guy with the with the other things. But you're not, you're not an ace, and you're you're not crappy either. Yeah. But, so that's kind of where we went. Um, you don't have classes. You pick what you want to be good at, but then mm -hmm. you, you use those skills if you want to get good at them. Yeah. Uh, you can't just do a hundred different things and expect your character to get good at any of them, you know, if you're not kind of specializing on what you're doing. And that's that's where you can customize your character. Um, 
But, you know, if you get up pretty strong in something, decide you don't want to do it, you can always start doing something else, too. You're not shoeboxed into, no, you're a druid, your druid can't do that. Mm-hmm. So you, you can jump the fence and, and go for something else if you want. You're just going to start at the bottom for that particular skill. Yeah. Now... One of the one of the things that I did that I did find I did find very interesting when I was going through just the um we, just the weapon list is the is different different um damage based on different based on different techniques. Yes. Uh. Yep. And and that was Andy. He he spent a lot of time researching the weapons. He really did. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it, it makes a big difference on how you use your weapon. Um, there's some weapons that can really help you in defense. Uh, if you go in, you'll see a lot of uh, little asterisks and, and mm-hmm. pound signs and little check marks. And there's a lot of different things that a cer- certain weapons could do uh, on the battlefield. And that's one of the reasons a lot of people use them. And so, yeah, we went to, uh, depending how you want to use it, you, you basically got three, three different ways to use a weapon. You can mm-hmm. thrust. Uh, slash or chop and mm-hmm. chops normally the strongest because you're coming down with that force right on top and so normally on a chop the weapons did the most damage but uh but like spears and stuff you know uh, a, a thrust is the fastest move you mm-hmm. can make on any weapon really so i think thrust uh we have a a action economy mm-hmm. uh, depending on your speed that tells you how many actions you can do around mm-hmm and depending on how you use your weapon is how many actions that uses out of your action economy. So that's another thing people need to be aware of. Um, if, if you run out of, of actions you can do and your opponent still has some, they get a free attack. It doesn't necessarily mean they'll hit. They still have to roll a, a feat check against their dexterity to see if they hit. But mm-hmm. they do get a free attack because you're out of moves. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so that was brought in. It gives it a little more realism, um, mm-hmm. and we hope it hasn't slowed it down too much. That that's that was the big fight in any of this is you want to make it real and fun, but you don't want to have that hour and a half battle scene like we used to have. And uh, that's that's one of the reasons we went to the roll off, and and we're really trying to figure out how to speed up combat because mm-hmm. it seemed like you do about. 15 minutes of role play and you'd have an hour and a half or two hours in a big battle and you're done. I mean, it was just kind of done for the night. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So we tried to level that out a little bit by, by trying to speed up our combat. So we've been trying to keep it real, but not to the point where it just slows everything down to a crawl. Yeah. And with that in mind, given, given how action die and speed score are so important in combat, I'd like to ask a bit about the re- the relationship between s- between speed score and weapons, since weapon speed is something that um, a lot of people don't touch upon these days. Well, and and maybe that's because they think it slows it down too much. If they, it's another thing you've got to think about. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because d- depending on your weapon and your speed, you know, just kind of just going back to a spear. Uh, you know, if, if you're a six speed, which is really slow, you can only use that spear one every two rounds. So once every six seconds, mm-hmm. you know, you go up to where you're a 20 speed and, and you get, you can use it three every round. So you can thrust that three times every round, every three, basically once a second. Yeah. Um, and, and, and this is where, uh, you know, it used to be you wanted to be the strongest character up front. That was your, your goal. If you were going to be on the front line, strength. Mm-hmm. Um, in real life, speed plays a lot bigger role. Uh, you know, if you can pull off two more attacks every round than your opponent, he might have give you four more points of damage, but you stabbed him three mm-hmm. more times or two more times. Yeah. Uh, and you've done a lot more damage. So it, it kind of makes you rethink. Mm-hmm. There's a Tom T, and he's he's one of the characters in Mystic Days, one of the one of the species we have that uh, has some pluses to speed and dexterity. And wow, they're they're not big. They're they're probably uh, 
oh, average probably four and a half foot tall, maybe. Mm-hmm. But their speed is amazing, and, and the amount of attacks they can have in a row and in a round. Um, and and because they're so fast, they're hard to hit. Mm-hmm. So it, uh, yeah, it makes you rethink. Yeah, you just re- rethink your weapon and your uh, and who you want on the front line. I mean, of course, you want the stronger guy is going to take more damage, um, but the faster guy might not take damage because he can he can dodge and he can outperform. Mm-hmm. Now, just looking at the sheet, um, mm-hmm. um, looking at one of the two sheets that you that that you guys sent me, um, specifically Arger with his, um, with with his, um, I'll go I'll go with Fisticuffs, and that has the action rate of of five two. Would that mean that he'd get five attacks every two rounds, or? Yep, yep. So round one round would be two, and one round would be three, mm-hmm. and they've got to state what they're gonna do each round, so you know. Um, you know, if it, how many actions you're going to use this round three or two? That way, mm-hmm. you know, going forward, how it's going to work. Would it would it be a case where they where he where if he was doing if he was doing three one round that he'd roll he'd make an attack roll three times? If it depends on what he's doing. Uh, that goes back to the economy and fisticuffs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think a jab only costs you one one action, so you could jab three times. Uh, a hook or a cross. Uh, I don't have that sheet right in front of me. Let's see if I can find it. I think is two mm-hmm. each. So that's why I say that. That's where you've got your action economy that you want to pay attention to, mm-hmm. because once you run yourself out, if the other person still has some, um, you could be in trouble. So, so rea- so reactions still use that economy. Yes. Yep. All right, that that certainly makes sense. I, I figured that'd be yeah. that'd be a way to to um pre- to prevent people from just th- from just novaing and throwing all of the, throwing in all of their attacks. Um, right. And uh, also because of action economy, ganging up on somebody is a big advantage for mm-hmm. you, because they're going to run out of actions, and you'll still have you know if you're two people against one, more than likely you'll have some free attacks, and. Uh, if you don't have bad rolls, mm-hmm. that's free damage, you know. Yeah. But yeah, for, for fisticuffs, we've got a body press, a groin strike, mm-hmm. a hook, a jab, push off, a straight cross, a rabbit punch, an upper kick, a front kick, and a yeah. groin kick. And they either do one or two. It either takes one or two action. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's that's also with weapons. Uh, the most you're going to spend on on a, one of the techniques is two. And the quickest, of course, is one. Mm-hmm. Now, with the with with that in mind, now I met, I mentioned this to to Andy the other the other day when we were setting this up. Mm-hmm. But as a as a kind of putting things into practice, I want to run through a few a few archetypes seen seen in fantasy and how one might interpret those archetypes into. Mystic Days's um, sandbox. Okay. So, I'd like to start with what with what I've called what I've called the Weapon Master, the person who any who um he tends he tends to he tends to be the one who carries a variety of weapons and all of them he can use. Um, he's the he he's the person who's who would be decked out in in primary and secondary weapons, almost like he's a medieval version of Commando. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, cuz when it, whenever I do fighters I always try I always try and encourage people to double down on the weapon master I you can wield any kind of weapon bring more than just your sword and board Right right um how it works is you can you can buy weapon proficiencies mm-hmm. um and you can buy group proficiencies now group proficiencies would be like uh similar sized swords so, mm-hmm. so you know a cutlass, a, a bastard sword, um, mm-hmm. or or axes, um, but you can't. You, you have to buy the proficiency separate for an axe from a sword. They're, they're completely different type of fighting styles. Um, it's 
unlike the movies, you don't just swing. You know, if you're going to be good at it, you, you know how to use your weapon. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, and, and there again, as you use it, you get better and better with it. You improve your dice that you use. Um, another thing you can take if, if you want to be a fighter is you can take the martial arts sk special skill. And that, of course, is going to give you uh, pluses to your speed. Uh, it's not going to necessarily help you with your weapon skill, but mm -hmm. if you can do a roundhouse kick to somebody to the side as you're slashing with a weapon, that could be a whole different story for you. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's archery. I don't know if you've watched any of the archery uh, YouTube videos that the uh, people that can really use archery. Uh, I have. Shooting around 55 gallon drums, that type of thing. It, mm -hmm. It's amazing what people can actually do it with a, with a bow. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's the archery special skill you can take that will help you in combat. Mm -hmm. um, there's blind fighting. Uh, are the combat skills you can take that are strictly combat? You've got archery, blind fighting, martial arts, weapon throwing. Mm hmm. And then, of course, getting your weapon proficiency, buying your weapon yeah. proficiency. Now, when it comes to weapon proficiencies, is it would it mostly be buying the, buying them by individual weapons, or are there are there um, weapon prof proficiency packages that could be bought? Yes, there are packages. Mm -hmm. um, you can buy the table on that, so I can tell you just how the groups go. Um, Find it, find it, find it. You know, you you have your head in here, but if you're not using it for play all the time, you're not going back and forth to the. I can forth. I can certainly under I can certainly understand yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, the groups. Mm -hmm. You've you've got a pole gar pole arm class, which would be you know your your voucher, your glaives, halberd, javelin, mace. Mm -hmm. You know, pole mace, man catchers, ranciers, sky spears. That's that's all one group that you can buy. Mm -hmm. um, and what that does is that that ups you. Mm -hmm. uh, then swords. You got bastard, broad, cutlass, falchion, gladius, katina, copish, long, rapier, saber, scimitar, short. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the axe class, or two-handed, and you've got the battle axe, woodman's axe, claymore, katina, mm -hmm. because that can be used either way. Maul, short, or bastard sword, which can be used two-handed two also. Mm -hmm. Great sword, warhammer. Uh, small blades, dagger, dirt, you know, knife. Yeah. Uh, just your normal axes, maces, and picks, your normal size. And then archery, uh, for a cost, you can buy the group, that which is crossbow, uh, light and heavy, and then long bow and recurve. Yeah. So, besides that, you can buy each one single, separately. Mm -hmm. And as I as I understand it, in order to get in order to get better proficiency or or um, or get more proficiencies, that would require um, that would require spending de spending the points you get from decks. Right, but 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 decks on the proficiency. You can only ever spend twenty dollars per weapon for the proficiency. Mm -hmm. you, you can't buy a, a plus two proficiency. You, you can get up to the plus one, mm -hmm. and then the only way you're going to increase proficiency from there is using it and being successful or unsuccessful. But but raising your points that way mm -hmm. through five points. You know, like I said, I think it was five points every successful hit, and one mm -hmm. two points every unsuccessful until you get to a hundred, and then you raise a dice. And then mm -hmm. it goes back, and you start again. Yeah. And with that, with that in mind, when when it comes to given how ev given how everything is on that one is is on that one hundred point um, yeah. affair. Um. On on further de on further developed um, character sheets, do you, do you have do you have plans on putting? On putting materials so that that so that those points can be tracked. Uh, he he did not send you a sheet, huh? Uh, we've got it's a simple sheet, mm -hmm. and yeah, I wish you would have sent you one. We we could email you one, uh, but but what it is basically is 
you have room to put your weapon mm -hmm. and you just have a column successful unsuccessful and and you can put multiple weapons depending on what you have you can do that with your spells you can do it with everything and all you do is you fight and you just put a check in successful or unsuccessful mm -hmm. as you're doing it for each weapon or each spell uh it's really quick once you get used to doing that it's easy to forget like anything yeah until you get used to it but but it's really quick you just put the check there and then at the end of the adventure you just count them up and, and go from there mm -hmm. and uh so it, it's really a, a, a quick way this tally sheet we've got to keep track of everything as you're doing it mm -hmm. to where it doesn't take any more than just putting a little check in the box you know yeah and uh, I, I thought he might have sent you one with the uh with the character data sheets probably didn't think about it. i wouldn't have either mm -hmm. but it's, it's a real simple it's just a success fail box that you put your check in yeah that was something i was worried about because when i i didn't see any means to track that on the on the sheet that was given yeah and given that given that there's a bunch of abilities that are that are being used and that's a bunch of um that's a bunch of progressions that are being tracked yeah, it, it would be a bit of it. It would be a bit of an ask to have somebody try and co try and cover all of that in their head. Yeah, yeah, no, no. This this is a real simple, simple little sheet. Like I said, you you got room for five or six weapons, and then there's just a box beside it, success, and a box beside that, fail, mm -hmm. and same with special skills and same with spells. Yeah. So, and it's just a matter of just putting that little check in there, you know, just four checks and a slash across for five like you would for anything mm -hmm. and, uh, and then at the end of the end of the adventure it's, it's real easy to count them up then and, and know just exactly what you have yeah now when it comes when it comes to when it comes to species mm -hmm. um some ga some games have an issue where where species are pr are relevant early on but even by even by mid game, your choice of species, your choice of race, species, ancestry, whatever, isn't all that relevant, because it, because it just ends up being a static modifier that doesn't mean much beyond beyond the early stages. Um, some ha some have it where it me where it means a heck of a lot more, like um, the Heavens and Heresies project by a colleague of the of the temple, mm -hmm. but. How, but how much of a factor does your choice of species play in character creation? It, it, it does in your your bonuses, the attributes, mm -hmm. and what they can do. I guess after creation and you get those initial, uh, there's no progressive help that we have incorporated into the species. I guess I never thought about that. Yeah. Um, it's just that initial, when you make it, uh, you know, your, your dwarfs, uh, they're they're big time frontline fighters. Uh, they heal hourly instead of daily on, on their constitution. Uh, they've got real thick skin. It's equivalent to leather armor, um, and and they can be the strongest out of any of the species. Mm -hmm. So your dwarf, of course, would be a great frontline fighter. Of course, gnomes. They're small. They're they're not many hit points. You're not going to want to be frontline with a gnome. Uh, but gnomes and elves are, are pretty highly magical so mm -hmm. they're the ones that have got more pluses of the wisdom intelligence and what they can do mm -hmm. uh, each species uh after you've created them up and and and, and added in your, your your modifiers they've also got an additional ability that is species uh, specific mm -hmm. that you'll roll for um it's, it's just a d4 it's one of four characteristics mm -hmm. of each species that he will have that uh the other species, uh, you could work up to. I mean, I mean, one might be uh, you, you've got a high proficiency for bows, so you start out as a second degree specialty archer, mm -hmm. and you don't have to pay for that skill. You just start out that way and go from there. Mm -hmm. uh, but others are like like the gnome is. Uh, they've got the uh, Druger Doom, Druger Doom, which is against undead. Mm -hmm. So they're the ones that can turn undead, and uh, so it just depends on your species. You you want to look and, like I said, a lot of people get kind of caught up on strength and and that that's not necessarily the the have all in this game. Um, the uh, Tomtes, I think I mentioned that earlier, they're highly magic resistant. They can't even cast magic. 
they can't even use a lot of magic artifacts. Uh, they're that resistance to magic, but you know, what a great guy to have for a thief if they're gonna be running into magical traps and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So there's just things that you want to look at as you're going, but but after initial rolling up your character and picking your species and, and giving yourself your bonuses and everything for that, there really is nothing that we put into play at this time mm -hmm. that is going to help down the road. And yeah. have you played games that do that? Um, I have. As far as, as far as as far as that as far as that goes, it's. I've played. I've played a. Wi I've played a wide variety of, of games. So, um, a lot. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff that I've. Se there's a lot of stuff that I've seen. I know. Okay. I know that doesn't help much, but no, no. But uh, yeah, I just. I, I never thought of having some sort of a progressive help for your species. Yeah. You know, like get. Um, in so far advanced. Heavens and Heresies is a game that we that I've talked about quite a bit here in the temple that. That that does put a lot of emphasis on on your choice of in that case ancestry. It's okay. it's going to determine your hit point rate. It's going to determine um, what what um, feet what features and what ability score advancements you'll you'll end up get you'll end up getting at certain levels. Sometimes you okay. might, and it'll also determine what's referred to as fortitude and focus, which is essentially a safety cap when it comes to physical and mental. Um, conditions, okay. and the and the high severity of the of those conditions that you that you can take safely. So, sir, a, a someone someone with a high fortitude, they can t they can take deep they can take a bunch of debuffs without it without it getting a bunch of debuffs when it comes to physical stuff, without mm -hmm. it getting without it getting worse. Okay. Because once it goes over that cap, you run the risk of some of it becoming um, harder to recover from. Okay. And focus works the same way with me with mental stuff, but the and of course the other thing is that it determine is that in that system, your ability your starting ability scores and your starting ability defenses are also determined. Uh, but. As well, as well as how proficiency upgrades, and not everybody is going to get the highest amount of proficiency at twentieth level in that system. There's a, there are a, there are other instances. A lot of a lot of people will do a will do a set a set of modifiers, or in some cases a set of maximums, and a uni a unique ability for e for each species. It's there's a there's a wide amount of variance in ter in terms of how it's done. Those are just a those are just a few small examples. Okay. All right. Oh. Yeah, something I hadn't mm -hmm. thought of. <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, we don't do levels, so there again, that's mm -hmm. another spot that would be a little harder to incorporate, I guess. Oh. I'm not. I'm not saying take. I'm not saying take that. Take that exact route, but. Right. Having right. having a having some having a abil having a ability or even having ju even having just just um just sk just skills that are exclu that are exclusive to cer to certain races um is is one possibility that can be that can certainly be considered. And I'm not saying that's the way to do it. Just saying that's a possibility. Okay. Um yeah. Now when it now when it comes to C continuing on the ar continuing on the archetype thing mm -hmm. um if some if somebody wanted to do a if somebody wanted to do a spell sword st style of gish someone who instead of instead of doing the whole thing of of using sword play and occasionally casting ranged spells they use their magic to enhance their Martial capability. How, how would what would be the, what would be some ways that you could interpret that into this system? Um, we have ways that uh, spellcasters can make their own artifacts. Mm -hmm. um, it's not easy, but they can. So uh, that's in our, our our third book. A lot of the artifacts in there, um, but there there is uh, different enchant enchantments they can do. Mm -hmm. to enhance their strength, enhance their speed. Um, 
none of which on just the spell end of it is permanent. Uh, you know, if they were to just cast a spell to increase your speed or increase your strength, uh, that wouldn't be a permanent spell. That would be a, a time spell. Uh, be it however long that you wanted to, to cast a spell for. And, uh, but there are ways to cast it to an artifact, which would give you permanence as long as you held on to the artifact. Um, I, I guess, is that what you're talking about? To, to make you stronger, make you faster, make your skills better. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because there there's there are spells that they can do that with, but it would uh, it would be time dependent if they're mm -hmm. just casting them on themselves. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm get I'm guessing that in that third book you do have a system for, um, pe for both players and GMs to create custom artifacts. Yes. Yep. Yeah, there's about 300 enchant. I think 300 enchantments that we have in that book. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, if, if you can think of it, like I said, we've, we, we've got the framework in place that, that you can figure out what, how much energy points, how much time it would take to cast that. Because your your, your casting time is dependent upon the magic user. Um, yeah, their intelligence dictates how many energy points they can actually channel in a round. And mm -hmm. uh, and you know it might take you a week <laughs> to to do a certain or you might have to get multiple spell casters together to do an enchanted item and uh conjoin your powers together to to make that enchantment but it hmm. can be done oh. but it's not something that's flippant and easy you know it's no. not something you're just going to be throwing artifacts all over with with magic abilities no, when I don't think I don't think you guys are gonna are going to fall into the trap of Monty Hall. What, what's that? Um. Well, the Monty Hall obviously the name obviously Mon, Monty Hall is loose is loosely based on is loosely it's obviously named after the the former host of Let's Make a Deal. Right. But right. in context, somebody somebody. T um, switched out his last name so it's H A U L. It's okay. basically it's basically to refer to GMs who are who are a little bit too generous for their own good when it comes to giving player rewards. No, no, um, and that's why I say it. the amount of energy points you're you're pumping into this. You better hope you have good rolls because if it goes wrong, it's going to be really really ugly. Yeah. So another another archetype I'd I'd like to I'd like to ask about is um is I guess I'll put it as bottle go boom somebody who 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 um likes who likes making concoctions but not to heal or for, or any sort of salve or potion or like that no he likes making bombs oh yeah the, the <laughs> alchemist we we have an alchemy special skill mm -hmm. for poisons uh, acids that type of thing we do have in the ag's guide um which for those i, I guess I, I haven't defined any terms ag's uh adventure guide that's what we call our mm -hmm. dm dm is just the ag but we do have the tables in his guide for gunpowder now whether he wants to allow that in his campaign we left that up to the ag i know a lot of ags don't want to deal with that they won't they don't want bombs um but it's in there. Uh, so yeah, they've got acids, corrosives. Uh, yeah, the alchemist could be a really nasty, fun person to play. Mm -hmm. um, especially, I mean, you just think of clay containers hanging from trees that your archer can hit full of acid and different things. Um, you could have a lot of fun with an alchemist. Yeah, and I, I think I told you this. I think I told you last time the story of the up button. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but. Beyond the, beyond that, so I remember I remember saying I I want I remember saying in one campaign I want to make a guy who's good with bombs. And it's like okay, okay what okay what kind of bombs do you want to use? Yes. No no no. What bombs do you want to use? Did I not make it clear? Yes. This is a, this is somebody who who's a <laughs> who's a who does not believe in the concept of friendly fire. I want to use them all. <laughs> And because of how I set, because of how I set it up, and was using and was abusing multi attacks for fighters, 
This guy was throwing. Th this guy was throwing three vials of gr of Greek fire every round. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Oh, like a. Yeah. What, what, what we put in for the players was just uh, acids, mm -hmm. corrosives, explosive kit can can do some small explosives if if the DM wants to mm -hmm. up to a thirty foot diameter spear, which is pretty damaging. Yeah. Um, poison kit and mm -hmm. then tranquilizer. So yeah. those are the, the things that the alchemist can do. Oh. And then of course the healer, he's the one that does the the potions, you know, mm -hmm. for curing curing poisons and healing and yeah. uh, disease that type of thing. I have run a harm assist at least once. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is exactly what it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, we uh, we incorporated certain kits, um, you know, like travel kits. I mean, it's not like you're going to carry your alchemy lab with you. So mm -hmm. depending on what you have for a kit is what you're going to be able to make unless you can find it in a, in a dungeon or something. Um, now, you talked about making artifacts earlier, but... Is make is making scr is making scrolls something that's also on on the possibility table? It is, and to be honest, I haven't even thought about that. Because mm -hmm. um, I mean, what a what a scroll would consist of in Mystic Days is an explanation of how to weave that spell into what you want it to be. Mm -hmm. uh, the scroll itself really holds no magical abilities. Uh, I think if I remember right in D and D, this the scroll itself was magical. You know, when you read off the scroll, um, uh, Mystic Days, it isn't. It would be uh, directions on on how to go about weaving that spell properly, mm -hmm. uh, how to weave those energies together. So it, it's more of just something you would have to write out. But now that you mention that, there should be you shouldn't just be able to pop out a hundred scrolls. Uh, you should have to be to a certain certain degree of your spell casting ability before you could properly write out a scroll so that is something that thank you yeah um <laughs> some games some games take the approach of your of um making making a scroll is tre is treated as a attempt at casting you're just not mm -hmm. resolving the effect immediately um you're do you're doing it to see if you, to see if you can put the put the effects into 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 a scroll um so, and taking that taking that approach with something like that with something like this, it's you could someone could probably hack it into into just the just the um hold the hold and the hold energy that you already have. Um, <laughs> and of and of course, if you're if you're making if you're making that kind of roll, it's still ju it's still just as risky because right. well, you're de you're dealing with magic, so. Brace for explosions. Yep. Um. And I, I, I hadn't even thought about the writing of scrolls, so yeah. you know, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. You, I'm sure you're not going to be the first one. <laughs> no. One yeah. other one other avenue that a lot of games struggle struggle with that I'd be curious how you how you guys are handling it is the issue of dual of dual wielding. I e if I e if somebody if somebody's bringing in a say say a say a sword and a and a dagger in their offhand, right? Which they can. Um, we we're not against that, but uh, like dual wielding, you're still only going to be as good as you are with that particular weapon, mm -hmm. and and each swing is still going to cost you whatever of your actions. It's it's not going to give you extra actions just because you have two weapons, you know, one in each hand. Yeah. So you're still going to use up your action economy with that, also. Mm -hmm. So it, it's something that that uh, I guess we don't have anything called dual wielding, but we're fine with it, um, just because they got to get good with those weapons and and they got to have the action economy to do it. So that's kind of on them on on if they want to do that. Which certainly makes sense. Yeah. Now. I know. Now, given the given the success that you get that you guys have had with this with this current Kickstarter, yeah. um, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window for the books? 
Well, we put on there February 23. We just put six months out. Mm -hmm. And that's because we know it won't be a problem. Uh, our, our first two books are done, final editing, the whole shot. Uh, we've got to finish up that last chapter in the Creatures and Coins, and that's the enchantment chapter, mm -hmm. and then get it to final editing. And so that'll take really more than likely will be done by end of September with all that. But then we've also got to get the dice. Mm -hmm. um, and that's through Impact Miniatures right out of Indiana. So I don't foresee an issue. But with shipping and everything the way it is, I'm not sure if Impact makes their dice in Indiana or if they order them out of country. I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that's not going to be an issue, but that could slow us up too. Uh, we're, we're really hoping to have it in people's hands quicker than February by far. But we, we picked February 23rd. We picked six months out from the end of this just to make sure that there'd be no issues. Mm -hmm. We want to be positive. So we, we've seen some of those that are, you know, two years out and people still haven't got it. And we did not want to be in that predicament at all. Um, mm -hmm. We've actually got a couple campaign worlds that we're, that we're working on. Uh, so we should have two campaigns, two different campaigns people can. Uh, uh, delve into uh, mm -hmm. within six months or so we're, we're, we're getting some adventures around for each one so that'll come up kind of nice to have a campaign world uh, I know a lot of a lot of people like to make their own worlds and that's great but then a lot of people don't a lot mm -hmm. of people like to be able to just grab one and not have to have all that extra work to, to play the game so we're hoping to have those out pretty quick too yeah I can, I can certainly understand that yeah and I, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how that develops. But yeah, with... we're hoping to have that out soon. Mm -hmm. yeah. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you and Andy, even if fate, even if the Displacer Beast got him, <laughs> for, com for coming all the way back to the temple and enjoying the madness at play around here. Oh, no problem. Thanks for having us again. Um, you know, this is how people hear about stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like I say, we're just a couple country boys from Michigan, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. It is encouraged, and I had my Amber Bach here with me, so. So I was that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Uh, it's great talking with you. Mm -hmm. It, it, it's always good to talk because then you learn things that you didn't think of, you know, mm -hmm. just like the scrolls. And, so, thank you. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>